Welcome to the Neuroendocrine Cancer UK Q&A session on the subject of gastrointestinal symptoms with Dr. Raj Shrajaskanthan. This series of Q&A sessions has been created as part of the Neuroendocrine Cancer UK Virtual Patient Handbook, which is due to be released in 2023. My name is Beth and I'll be hosting these sessions with various medical experts covering a range of questions within neuroendocrine cancer care. Although I have worked with Neuroendocrine Cancer UK for a little while now, I'm not a medical professional myself and so in many senses I'm learning alongside you, the audience. Some of the questions I'll be asking have been taken directly from the Neuroendocrine Cancer community and the focus of these sessions will be on providing useful information and advice in a concise audio-visual format. In this session, Dr. Raj Rajaskanthan will be answering a range of questions on gastrointestinal symptoms. But firstly, let's get to know him a little better. Good morning. Hi, um, I'm Raj Rajaskanthan and I'm a gastroenterology consultant at King's College Hospital and also lead the neuroendocrine tumour service. Um, and I've also been associated with NCUK um, for the last 10 years years plus and I've been a trustee for the charity for the last three or four years as well. So uh, thank you for inviting me to uh, participate in this uh, Q&A session. Thanks Raj. Um, so yeah, so this Q&A session is about um, gastrointestinal symptoms. So it's probably a good place to start by talking about the um, the gallbladder. So there's one question that we've we've received that's to do with symptoms relating to the gallbladder. What would some common symptoms um, or signs be that indicate um, issues occurring with the gallbladder specifically? So um, I think within the gallbladder, um, I mean, the most common problem that people develop with um, is related to gallstones, so kind of formation of gallstones. And the reason that's relevant is because a lot of patients with neuroendocrine tumours or neoplasms end up being treated with somatostatin analogues, um, so um, ocritide or langretide. And with long-term use, there's a risk of developing gallstones. Mm. So um, kind of in, in the studies like Clarinet and, and Promid, um, about 10 to 12% of patients develop gallstones within two years. Mm. And some of the other kind of longer studies have shown that um, it can be up to 20 to 30% as well over long-term use. Mm. A lot of the time, the gallstones don't cause any problems. So they're just an incidental finding on scans. Um, but occasionally the gallstones, if they kind of track into the what we call the biliary system, then they can cause problems um, and you can get symptoms related to that. Um, so kind of commonly the symptoms of kind of gallbladder disease are kind of the medical term would be things like biliary colic or cholangitis, but primarily often what people describe are pain, usually in the kind of right upper quadrant, just under the rib cage on the right side. Um, and that can be associated with some kind of nausea or feeling sick and, and vomiting. Um, sometimes that pain can also be more central, so under the breastbone, and also can radiate, kind of go through to the back or to the shoulder blade as well. Um, now, this can often occur maybe after a large meal or a fatty meal, um, but sometimes can be independent of that. And it can last a few minutes, but up to a few hours. So it's kind of a, a, a range of symptoms, but those are commonly what we see associated with the gallstones. Mm. and if, if they cause problems mm. okay and so if they were causing um problems in that sense would um i believe there's a cholecystectomy is the removal of the gallbladder is yeah that so would that exactly. be the kind of course of action or yeah i mean we can try a dietary change initially kind of going on to kind of a gallbladder friendly diet as such mm -hmm. so kind of trying to reduce foods and changing diet to see if we can minimize episodes and severity but um Okay, and ultimately, I think if ongoing symptoms and it's troublesome, then often cholecystectomy may be required. Mm -hmm. The patients who with neuroendocrine neoplasms often, if they're going, say, for surgery, maybe to remove some of the tumors in the liver or even in the bowel, we often do a kind of preemptive cholecystectomy as well at that time to reduce this risk in the future. Um, but um, yes, I think that the definitive treatment would be a, a cholecystectomy if needed. So there's a re related question um, next up. So bile salt malabsorption, uh, what is it and how is it treated? So that's a very good question. <laughs> um, 
And it, it's quite difficult because basal malabsorption is um, not that well understood. So um, I think it's under underdiagnosed and kind of underestimated in terms of how common patients have symptoms from it. Um, and there are different types. There's kind of the what we call primary basal uh, acid malabsorption, which is where well, we're not really sure about the process that leads to the development of that. And there's secondary, which is after you've had an intervention, commonly surgery or something done, which can then cause it. So with the neuroendocrine tumour patient cohort, commonly it's that second type. So often they've had either a, a bowel resection, so they may have had some of their small bowel, commonly the area called the ileum, removed. And the reason that's relevant is because that's where these sorts are normally reabsorbed. Okay. So um, kind of just to run back a bit. So basically bile is made by the liver um, and its, its function is to help with digestion of fats and other uh, components from food. And so the idea is when you eat food, the kind of gallbladder and, and liver drains bile into the kind of small bowel. And then that helps with the digestion process. And then what happens is as, as the bile sorts travel down, they get reabsorbed at the end of the small bowel and then they go back to the liver and it's kind of like a, a, a loop. And so therefore they can be reused. Now, if you take out the end of the small bowel, then basically those sorts can't be reabsorbed. So they then run into the colon. And what happens there is that because it's uh, kind of bile acids, it then causes like a secretory effect in the colon. So it causes water to be produced into the colon. And then that causes the urgency and the diarrhea that patients often experience. So that's kind of the, the rationale behind it. Yeah. Um, and then, and that's why it can also be quite erratic because some days it won't be too troublesome. Other days it can have very troublesome symptoms um, and it's very difficult to kind of predict and it's very difficult to modulate the diet to kind of minimize those symptoms because you can't always identify that. So that's um, kind of the process behind kind of bile acid malabsorption and why it's common in patients who've had surgery, especially kind of a small bowel resection or right hemiclectomy for their neuroendocrine tumor. Okay, so um, in terms of treating it, is there, so you said it's kind of, it can be difficult to tell what the, maybe the causes mm -hmm. or the triggers are, at least in the diet. Um, is there any kind of um, suggestions for treatments of that or? Yes, I think when, if the history is suggestive of it, so for example, someone who's had surgery, who's then post-surgery developed this, and it's persisting, you know, six months greater after surgery, Sometimes the stool might be slightly more kind of orangey in nature. Um, sometimes the diarrhea seems to be completely unpredictable in, in that respect. Um, then you may think, oh, that's likely. Now you can either do a, a test called a CCAT scan that can help confirm the diagnosis formally. Um, but often we can also just try treatment with something called bile acid sequestrants, which are basically tablets that help or, or a sachet that helps reabsorb those bile salts. Um, and so those can often be started and then you can kind of try to treat the dose depending on benefit and effect and that one works quite well for patients. Can you tell us a bit about the change in colour of stools and what that might indicate? So specifically there was a question around orange stools which you just mentioned. Um, why could this occur and is this something to be concerned about and either way is it treatable so perhaps the the specifically the orange might be hmm. related to what you were just talking about yeah I mean so kind of orange stool can also occur due to kind of food so if you eat foods high in say beta carotene so like carrots or sweet potatoes and pumpkin then sometimes that can cause a yellow uh, orange discoloration to the stool but again it can be linked to this kind of bile acid malabsorption you can sometimes see that and then in terms of other stools of, of relevance in patients with neuro and neoplasms, again, it's the, the other ones would be the pale stools, the white floaty stools that we often see with um, what we call steatorrhea. So again, often with patients on the somatostat analogs, um, what happens there is that, that that drug can often inhibit secretion of kind of normal digestive enzymes on the pancreas, commonly something called lipase. And so as a result, you don't absorb the fat very well from your food. And so fat is um, usually pale um, and um, floats because it's lighter than water. So if people start seeing that their stool is kind of paler or white, difficult to flush, quite odorous um, and floating on top of kind of the water, then that's often a sign of, of steatorrhea, okay. in which case, you know, treatment for that um, could be considered as well. 
On to the next question. So what are mesenteric fibrosis and desmoplasia and are they the same thing and how are they treated? So, um, I mean, mesenteric fibrosis, um, we often comment on it about when we look at scans and kind of we often do see it with patients with small bowel, kind of neurodefined tumours um, commonly. It, as to how it occurs, it, we don't really understand it very well. And it is an area of kind of ongoing research, to be honest. Um, what we think is happening is that the tumour cells, um, either within bowel, small bowel primary or within kind of the lymph nodes um, that it drains to, are producing kind of local factors, uh, local kind of um, uh, signals, which are then causing kind of a reactive change. So kind of scarring and, and what we call fibrosis is like, you know, scarring and, and, and kind of deposition there. And then that causes, um, if you imagine kind of a, an area of scar forming, it can then cause um, the bowel to be drawn in, so kind of like a tethering process. So the bowel gets drawn into um, together, so the loops get drawn together. So that can then cause mechanical problems like obstruction because you kind of create a kind of a closed loop. Mm -hmm. But also this tethering can occur around blood vessels. Um, and so therefore what can happen is it can impinge on the flow into the gut from those vessels. And so that can cause something called um, mesenteric ischemia, which basically the mesentery is kind of the organ or where the blood vessels flow and ischemia is basically a, a reduction in blood supply. And so therefore, sometimes you can get a uh, buildup of, kind of like a lactic acid type effect. So you kind of get um, episodes where the blood supply can't get through to the gut as much as it's needed. And that causes like a mesenteric ischemia, which can often present with quite severe pain and symptoms with that. So that um, so that's kind of mesenteric fibrosis. And, and I suppose doesn't pleasure is kind of that is another term for that, for it kind of we use them kind of interchangeably, but it's more maybe more on the kind of scientific side of what we're seeing. Okay. So they are essentially the same thing, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, interchangeably. Okay. Um and, and uh, um, is surgery um, a treatment option for mesenteric fibrosis? I think um, often it's kind of the most definitive one if, if it's an option to undertake. Um, so if, especially if you've got someone who's developed, say, bowel obstruction due to the, or developed kind of intermittent partial obstruction due to the um, kind of fibrosis and, and it's kind of um, tethering of the bowel loops, then ideally, you know, if you can, remove that area of kind of troublesome bowel, then that would resolve that problem often. So surgery would be kind of the preferred definitive option. I think if that's not uh, um, suitable, so say if, for example, the location of mass is, you know, it's, it's such that it would mean that a large, you know, area of bowel may be, what is not feasible because of patient fitness or the large area of bowel would need to be removed which would kind of render or create new problems, which would be difficult to manage. And sometimes surgical approaches can't be taken, in which case we'd kind of try somatostatin analogs and then kind of other treatments, medical treatments, depending on if there's ongoing symptoms. So on to our next question. This is about pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy. Um, how should patients use pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy properly? And more specifically, how can they tell if they have too many? Um, so kind of there are a number of different preparations for the kind of what we call PER, so pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy. Um, in terms of taking them, so you should have them with every meal, every snack and kind of milk or drink. So that's kind of recommended. Um, and so often having a little travel pack with you that you have in your bag or kind of wallet can be useful because often if you're out and about, then you may end up not having to take them. Um, they should be taken kind of with the first bite of the meal. Um, so normally, or you know, as you're about to eat or with the first kind of few mouthfuls, you swallow them down, preferably with a cold drink, because um, if you have a hot drink, it can sometimes affect the coating and the capsule and so kind of cause um, impairment in terms of how it's absorbed. Um, and then other things are, so um, the capsules come in different doses. So historically, we used to have 40,000, 25,000, 10,000 capsules. And so most patients would be started on a dose of around, say, 75 or 80,000 uh, units. And so it'd be relatively just taking what two of the 40,000 capsules would work. Nowadays, we don't have access to those. So it's kind of 25, 10 are the main ones available. And like I said, since most patients will need around 75 to 
100,000 units, um, sorry, 50 to 100,000 units per meal or, or snack, they'd most likely take, say, two capsules with the first few bites, and then maybe a two kind of a bit later on. Okay. Um, and the other thing is if they're having a long meal, so for example, you know, in multiple courses or they're sitting down for over, you know, half an hour or so, then again, they may need to take further capsules towards the kind of, you know, after the first half an hour, 40 minutes, because these are just enzymes. And so they obviously don't last very long once they're um, being taken. Okay, thank you. Um, so there seems to be quite a few different brands of PET. Um, mm. Are there any differences between them and a patient's usually prescribed a specific brand or can they, do they just make that choice themselves? Um, yeah, so I think that they've kind of four main brands um, and we um, kind of use a variety of them. I think the most kind of commonly prescribed one is Creon um, and there are kind of Nutrizyme and Pancreas and other ones that people can use. Um, I think if there's some degree of issues with tolerance and we often can switch from one to another. Um, and often, you know, that's done in conjunction with dietitians. So um, I think there's a lot of kind of education and some opt suboptimal kind of utilization of, of the perks. Um, and often that then leads to patients thinking that they're not helping, but it might be just things that need to be changed in terms of how they're administered and the dose needed. And so that's where it, it helps to kind of work quite closely with your dietitian or your CNS to kind of help kind of optimize that part of the process. Okay, so there is kind of, um, a certain amount of choice over the dose, really, you can kind of see how that goes for you mm. as an individual, yeah. So next up, uh, we're talking about food intolerances. Um, are they always related to neuroendocrine cancer or can people just have them as well? And in which case, how can they tell the difference? Can they tell the difference? Um, I mean, that's a good question. So I think, it's, it's very difficult to know because obviously, as you know, kind of there's a real delay in diagnosis with a lot of patients with kind of NETs are often misdiagnosed as having IBS or food intolerances for a number of years in advance. Um, there's no reason you can't have both. So you can't have kind of a neuroendocrine tumor and have kind of food intolerances or irritable bowel syndrome as well. And also sometimes you can have symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome post treatment for your neuroendocrine tumors, especially after surgery or, or things like that. And you can develop other issues. So um, I think, I mean, there's certain, I suppose it's quite a complex area, but if you were to take the patients here with carcinoid syndrome, um, then whilst they don't necessarily have a food intolerance, certain foods will make their carcinoid syndrome symptoms worse. So if they have kind of foods high in amines, so things like, you know, aged cheeses or smoked mackerels or um, kind of vinegar or certain alcohols, those could then trigger off carcinoid related symptoms and so therefore you could argue that you know that would make them feel worse and they may class it as an intolerance but it's linked into the underlying condition yeah. um other people may have issues with kind of gluten intolerance and kind of problems with digestion either post-surgery so especially you know with the pancreatic net patients who may have had a wood pulse or things like that then how they eat and kind of how they digest food will need to be adapted and so Again, that's kind of a learning curve and, and often done in conjunction with the dietitians. So, um, so I mean, it's quite difficult to say, um, kind of definitely the food intolerances aren't, aren't net related. Um, but I think what we can do is look at each individual case and determine whether the symptoms would be attributable to the underlying kind of either treatments or things that they've had done, um, or whether it's, uh, if there's another cause. So uh, on to the final question, um, somewhat related to the last one. Um, so can, uh, can individuals get functional bowel disorder as well as neuroendocrine cancer or does neuroendocrine cancer cause it? No, so you can have both, like we're saying. So you can have a, um, so you can have IBS or other related symptoms um, separate to having a net. Okay, so that's quite common. Um, and then, treatments such as the analogs and, and surgery and other things can also then induce um, symptoms that could be suggestive of a functional disorder, but actually it's more likely to be a kind of either a mechanical issue or other kind of underlying problems that are leading to that. Um, and I think that's why it's quite important to kind of have kind of that multidisciplinary approach when you're managing patients, because dietitians can be quite helpful from that perspective. Yeah. 
in terms of advising, um, you know, and optimizing diet, depending on what people have had done in their previous procedures and operations. But also sometimes you need to, for example, bowel, salt, bowel absorption is very easy to label that as having IBS um, and saying to patients, you know, you've got IBS post-surgery. But actually there's a clear reversible cause there. And so um, some of the work that we've done is kind of developing, um, actually also in CK and ENETS are doing is kind of developing almost algorithms to kind of look at different gastrointestinal, gastrointestinal symptoms in their patients and running through kind of differentials on what to look at to investigate them. So for example, diarrhea, post-surgery, look at, um, you know, abdominal cramps and bloating yeah. patients on analogs maybe to look at statorrhea and and giving them pert um people who've had whipples or other surgeries may develop bacterial overgrowth um and need to be assessed for that so there's kind of a whole range of different um things to do and then obviously if, if those are looked at and when you've kind of mitigated them you've got ongoing symptoms then it's more likely a functional disorder yeah. which again could be benefit from either things like you know dietary modification or probiotics and things like that okay and when you talk about algorithms you mean a kind of almost like a flow to your um decision making kind of yeah just to help make sure that certain things are being looked at for individual cases so that you can help um direct so rather than just like i said saying to someone who's had a right hemicolectomy who's got diarrhea just take loperamide or codeine you would actually think about excluding BAM or trying treatment for that first before kind of heading down that route. So it's just to make sure that you've looked at the other differential diagnoses before just either identifying it as a functional disorder or kind of a, a recognized kind of post-surgical problem. So I was reading, have you heard of this piezo2, this receptor that um, there was like a Nobel Prize in 2021. It's a, um, this is a very simplified way of describing it, but it's, it's this receptor is also found in the colon and it's responsible for our sense of touch. And there was another one that was to do with temperature. But mm -hmm. basically what they, this kind of the group of the team that worked on it, they think it's interesting in that it could be targeted to treat chronic pain associated with gastrointestinal disorders in the future, mm -hmm. just like specific receptor. Um, so kind of along those lines, um, have there been any recent research or developments in gastrointestinal medicine that could be interesting for our audience? So I, think, I mean, so the, I think that the area of real kind of interest and growth is about understanding the gut flora and kind of the gut microbiota mm -hmm. and it's linked to health and disease. Um, and we know there's kind of an increasing body of evidence that kind of um, the gut flora is, is very critical to development of certain conditions, but also by changing the gut flora, you can improve conditions as well. So there's kind of, you know, for example, between patients with something called Clostridium difficile infection, so kind of a CDT, who've got refractory treatment, um, refractory antibiotics that can't clear this bug in the gut. If you do a kind of fecal um, micro uh, transplant, you can kind of, it has really good success rates. And there is some data looking at kind of developing something similar in terms of patients with very refractory IBS. Mm. Um, and then it's also understanding the interaction between the kind of the gut flora and diseases and, and whether or not, um, you know, gut health is linked to development of cancers and other conditions. And I think it's a, um, you know, there's there's a lot of work that's looked at, for example, there's certain um, clonic flora in, in, in patients, uh, sorry, in, in individuals um, in different parts of the world. And, you know, there's some lovely work by Tim Spector and his team at Kings where they've looked at kind of the Maasai Mara, for example, and their gut flora and their diversity there compared it to Western diets and shown that, you know, it can all, they're, they're almost... Um, gut bacteria that can help you lose weight because they're much more kind of energy consuming and, and things like that. So wow. I think over the next 10, 20 years, I think that area is going to expand massively and, and kind of may answer a lot of these questions um, mm. and, and may provide kind of new insights to therapy as well. Mm. So I think that's quite an interesting area from the kind of gastrointestinal perspective. Um, and even responses to therapies as well, whether by, for example, we know that having antibiotics pre certain 
treatments can impact response because it wipes out the gut flora. So maybe if we could diversify the gut flora better pre-treatments, we might be able to improve responses. So there's areas like that that people are looking at, but it's um, it's still in its kind of infancy as such, but it'll be an interesting area to watch. Yeah, I think um, it's already being discussed kind of just in the public sphere as well. Like I've heard mm. quite a bit about microbiome and um, yeah, so I think that is probably quite an exciting kind of avenue, isn't it? Mm. Um, I mean, the other area that I think may change and again may help with early diagnosis is kind of AI and yeah. um, kind of algorithms there, both in terms of reporting and, and monitoring and, and picking up, you know, a lot of patients with neuroendocrine tumors we know that they can, they've been present on historic scans, but maybe not seen because they're asymptomatic. And then, and obviously if you had some form of AI system that would help flag up some of these kind of things that may pick up. Um, and then also being able to kind of scan health records to identify if someone has a pattern of re re attend, you know, repeat attendances, mm -hmm. other differentials that might need to be looked at and things like that. So, and then blood biomarkers. So I think all of that area is quite fascinating. We're seeing kind of quite big changes happening um, kind of in the preclinical phase. And I think as they roll through, um, things like the GRAIL trials and, and all these other things where we're using, you know, preventative medicine and, and early diagnosis, it may help change our kind of, you know, the future of medicine and hopefully um, allow for earlier diagnosis, which will then be able to um, impact on kind of overall survival as well. Yeah. And is, is AI used at all at the moment in kind of reporting of, of scans? So, um, yeah, so there are, um, there are kind of AI tools that are used in, in reporting, um, definitely in the US, I know that they, um, and the trial data is there. I think they still involve some human oversight yeah. as well. Um, and so I think it will be another step to kind of get to that port of kind of autonomous reporting from there within kind of gastroenterology and endoscopy, we're using kind of AI routinely now for colonoscopy, um, for picking up polyps and, and identification of them. Um, and so that's becoming integrated into practice and we're only on the first generation of those tools. So as, as they kind of improve and that will improve. Um, and so I think in the next five, 10 years, we'll see massive growth in that. Um, and then it will be a case of working out how to kind of, you know, opt, you know, optimize it and, and how to kind of uh, integrate it into healthcare so that we can then kind of improve the health component of it um, as well. Kind of public health. Does it feel like from your perspective that there's, um, um, there's kind of interest in, in, in advancing it, you know, like you say, you're on the kind of first generation of, of that. Um, does it feel like there's, you know, updates on when the next kind of version is going to be coming through or does it feel like there's excitement? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think there is a lot of interest in it. Um, I think it is quite, it, we were discussing it last week and actually, you know, we were talking about AI and radiology and kind of, you know, some of the stuff that's going on. And then you have to kind of imbalance it with reality that the fact that you know hospitals within the same region can't communicate with each other <laughs> because the IT doesn't allow you to get results from you know primary care and, and other things and so yeah. you think you know we've got Extreme massive advances, advances going on on one yeah. end and then you've got really yeah. simple things like you know if I have a patient that lives in um somewhere in Surrey I can't do a blood request for them to use in Surrey you know they have to kind of I've come up to King's or we have to write to the GP or get the local team to do it, you know, and that the, it, there yeah. seems to be a real issue with kind of that very simple part of the process or what should be simple to kind of be able to integrate primary, secondary, regional care, especially for conditions that are, you know, uh, kind of super regional and covering large populations whereby you don't, you shouldn't need, it shouldn't be difficult to get simple yeah. things like a blood test done or to be able to get a scan report or be able to access what's going on elsewhere yeah. um and on the other hand we're looking at you know revolutionary advances in in technology there so i think that's one of the um difficulties is that you've got a lot of really wonderful stuff happening um but then sometimes the bread and butter stuff has never really been solved it'd be really good to be able to kind of you know um just get that bit done. <laughs>
Thank you so much, Raj, for joining me today for this Q&A session. And for those watching, I hope that this video on gastrointestinal symptoms has been um, useful for you. For those interested, this Q&A session is part of a series uh, where I speak to various medical experts covering a range of questions within neuroendocrine cancer. So uh, keep an eye out for those. And thank you again, Raj. Pleasure. Thank you very much.